discussion of concepts. Um, the, uh, we cover three different areas. We talk about uh, hard rock science, so physics and chemistry and biology and all those ideas. Then we talk about pseudoscience as well. And we talk about how that doesn't really fit in with the model of science. And then we have faith-based issues. And so tonight, it's more of a faith-based issue. Uh, Jason's been a member of the uh, group for a very long time. Jason has uh, studied the history of religion as well as Islamic history, is that right? Yeah, and um, done many presentations to the group over the years. It's really great PowerPoint. No PowerPoint tonight, so he's gonna have to make that work. Um, and uh, Jonathan is actually uh, a friend of mine from the Philosophy Cafe, who is a pastor in Hong Kong, who also has studied history, history of the church, philosophy, uh, aesthetics, and a whole raft of other issues. Um, and so basically we're gonna talk about that. I have no idea where this is gonna go, but hopefully we'll keep it interesting. I'll do my best. Um, and we're gonna talk about the, um, the biblical evidence and the biblical history of heaven and hell. And before I let you guys talk, I'm gonna say one thing and I'm gonna be quiet because you tell I'm starting to lose my voice a bit. But when I tell people I'm an atheist, which is something I tell people happily, um, it doesn't really communicate that much about me. Uh, because it's just something that I don't do. I don't believe in God. Um, but when people say, well, you don't believe in God, I'll say, well, you know what? It's like, I, it's not something I don't do. But there is something that I regularly avoid, and that is ever making a decision simply based on the possibility that there is a reward or a punishment in the afterlife. It just simply never enters into my thoughts. So for me, the basis for heaven and hell and the importance of heaven and hell within Christian thought is, uh, is really important. Um, all right, so Jason, we'll let you go first and uh, tell us about the origins of heaven and hell in the Bible. Okay, are we on? Uh, so first, I want to ask any of the people here, unless I'm stealing your thunder. So excluding the people who I know who believe in the Bible, who here thinks that the fall of Satan is in the Bible? Well, they've heard that story that the fall of Satan is in the Bible, that Satan was prideful and was kicked out of heaven, and that's how he ended up in hell. So a lot of Christians believe this is in the Bible, and it's not. They were in stories uh, from what's called the intertestamental period. And that is the period uh, from the book of Daniel, written about 167, B.C. to the first letters of Paul in 50 C.E. And during this period of time, there was a lot of factionalism in Judaism. This is when you see the rise of the Essene community, the Dead Sea Scroll community, the Essenes, the rise of the Pharisees, and, and the splintering and sectarianism. And so during the intertestament period, there's this explosion of apocalyptic writings. And this is where stories of Satan rising to power and his backstory start coming in. A lot of people think this is in the Bible, so uh, it's not. So I just wanted to start there. Okay, so why is that important? Why does it matter that that's not in the Bible? It's not because a lot of people think that it is, so like they'll, they'll argue, but the fall of Satan's in the Bible, therefore it must be true because it's in the Bible that he fell, so, but it's not there. So it's not there at all. Right, okay, so it's not there. Why is it important? How, how does that I said because a lot of these, a lot of evangelical Christians who are claiming that the, the Bible is literally true and without error, therefore every single word in it must be true. And then a lot of people who've never actually read the Bible say, well, it's just there. I'm like, well, no, it's not. Okay, so no one here tonight thought that it was. <laughs> oh, okay. You didn't raise your hand, man. What am I supposed to do? Okay. So one guy thought that it was. Right? How many people do you actually think are concerned about whether or not it is? It's not in the Bible. How does it? How does it motivate people's thinking about Christianity? It motivates their thinking because uh, and I'm working uh, my new job. I'm working with an evangelical Christian, and we were talking about this. And she's like, oh, the "Hell is real!" And, 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 and like, she literally believes all this stuff. Like it informs her entire life, and yet she's really, pardon the word, ignorant of what the Bible actually says and what it means. Yet it's running her life. Okay, but isn't it? Go ahead, I'm sorry. Hey. Yeah, no, um, I didn't raise my hand because we were excluded from that category. But um, 
just a, a few questions for you, Jason, and some statements about what you said. Um, just within the statement itself, I'm a little bit confused. I need some clarification because you said the fall of Satan, and then you mentioned that it, you thought it was mentioned in the book of Daniel, Daniel in the intertestamental period from 167 until Paul's writings. You know, it, was, it was during the intertestament period, which is from Daniel through the letters of Paul. That period is when all of these extra biblical books were written. Okay. Where he rises, but it's not in Daniel. That was the last book okay. of the Hebrew canon. That's why I asked you to clarify, because you had said it was Daniel, the intertestamental period. Um, and, and each of these names that we're mentioning means something to people in scholarship and in history and in biblical studies. So the intertestamental period, there's a lot of things going on there. Uh, Daniel as well. But my, the reason I'd ask that was because if it's mentioned in one of the books that we consider part of the Christian scriptures, then we wouldn't call it extra biblical. I think you're referring to the Apocrypha when you say extra biblical books? Yeah, also all the books that are not included in either the Old or the New Testament. Okay. One of the things I'm hoping through the course of the night, if we have time and it serves both of your purposes, uh, we can talk about is some of the dating issues. Um, I know I just got a chance to read a little bit of Jason's book, uh, Manifest Destiny. And I have Insanity. Insanity. Okay, sorry. I had a hard time finding it because the name is Diogenes of Mayberry. Uh, not Jason Sylvester, but uh, in there, Jason shares some of his uh, sources his, uh, and scholarship that he's depending on, and we'll hopefully talk about more of that, if that's okay. Um, but I'm excited to talk about Daniel because for a long time, maybe 50 years ago, 70 years ago, it was a very normal thing for people to get around and date Daniel at 167, uh, like we did. That would be a surprise to some of you who are maybe students of the Bible because you find Daniel in the Old Testament as a prophet there, and uh, so Let's just come back to that in a minute. Why Daniel is where it is in the Old and the New Testament, or the, the Christian Old Testament and the Hebrew Canon. So, yeah, so, yeah, so, yeah, let's so, come back to that. Yeah, at, and as we do, uh, the reason I say it was exciting and I use that word is because even though that was accepted scholarship that began in Germany, now it's actually very few people who would hold that particular date of Daniel for historical and archaeological reasons. And I know that's exciting for Jason as well because Jason says he's open to any kind of historical archaeological evidence, so I do hope we'll have a chance to talk about some of those details. Okay, so uh, before we get to a Bible off, yeah. um, I want to know why it's important when Daniel was written. And and, and so why is it important? So, uh, Jason, you go first, and then yeah, I can Jonathan. Guess. It's important from the fact of the, the existential crisis that was going on in Judaism at the time. Now keep in mind, this is less than 200 years before the birth of Jesus. So these are radically new ideas in Judaism. It's the, own, the book of Daniel is the only book, the only book of the Hebrew Bible that has an apocalyptic tone. And the fact that it was written around 167 BC is because this is the time of the, the Assyrian emperor, um, uh, the Seleucid Empire, uh, under one of Henry, uh, Alexander. So when Alexander's uh, empire crumbled, Ptolemies are in Egypt and the Seleucids are, are up in Syria. So they're, they're running the show. And uh, this was the Hellenic period. So as these Hellenizing ideas were coming into Judaism and modernizing, a lot of the Jews were feeling, uh, not all, traditional Jews were feeling very marginalized, uh, especially this concept of the, the Greek gymnasia where you worked out naked. So if you're circumcised, you know, there's a little bit of, I don't want to show you. And so when Antiochus IV started cracking down, uh, some of these traditional Jews, and we know it in the, in the story of Hanukkah, the Judah Maccabee, when they fought back. So the, the Maccabean tribe stood up and fought back because they didn't like this modern Greek philosophy. And so when they saw that their society was being uh, feared of being annihilated, Judaism undergoes a 180 degree theological shift. That shows up in Daniel chapter 12, verse 2. It's the only verse in the Hebrew Bible that talks about an afterlife. So it's very critical when that showed up. Okay, so can I blow your mind? Just because I want to summarize uh, and make sure everybody else. Okay, so what you're saying is the book of Daniel was written in 167 BC. Roughly. Okay, so and it's fairly easy to date from the scholarship that that's where it came from? Yes. So that's what you're saying? Okay. And that's important because the Jewish community was going through a crisis. Yes. And so they started changing their theology and offering a bonus, right? Just saying, hey, stick with us, you get the afterlife as well. 
Is this right? The, no, it's more the a change in the, the the messianic kingdom went from being here, the kingdom on earth, to the messianic afterlife. So it shifted that we're being annihilated. We're the chosen people. Shit, it's not happening. So maybe it happens in the afterlife. And that's why Daniel is important. Okay, John. Yep. No, and, and again, I, I, I'll let David corral me back to the thing that you want. But it's interesting to me because I think it is a skeptic setting, and so we had quite a long list of claims and statements about the Old Testament. So yeah, I think it's serving us well if we're skeptical about them. Um, and I'm going to save the date of Daniel for the last because I think it's again more exciting. Forgive me for using that word. But the yeah, uh, people are really excited. Yeah, I'm excited. I'm the only one in the room excited about. It. So whenever we talk about these things, I think it's a surprise to some people who have done maybe a little, well, not a little bit, but a lot of reading in the Old Testament to hear that Daniel chapter 12 and verse 2 is the only mention of an afterlife, which is not correct. Uh, secondly, that it's the only apocryphal type writing. And just, just so you know where, where I am a pastor and where I'm a minister, we do a type of preaching which is expository. It doesn't mean it's right or wrong, true or false. It just means that we systematically go through the Bible verse by verse. And so for some of the folks who attend those services with me would be surprised to hear we're preaching through a series on Isaiah, which is another Old Testament book, which has apocryphal passages. Ezekiel has those passages. Joel has those passages. Amos, these are all apocryphal. Zechariah, yes. And this is going to set up something which I think will be helpful for the discussion. These in the Old Testament, they talk about things in an apocryphal way, quite clearly. Uh, similar to Daniel, although sure Daniel is the most extreme. And then when it comes to the afterlife, there are many, many other passages. And unless I misunderstood Jason or he didn't state it clearly, he said the only mention of the afterlife was Daniel 12 too. But what I anticipate happening is if we start to go through the other mentions of the afterlife in the Old Testament, what we're going to hear is that since the afterlife is a late doctrine, those must be late texts. And you say, well, why is the text late? Because the doctrine's in it. I think some of you would be able to see the circularity of that to say that here's a doctrine we believe to be late. It's present in this Old Testament book. Therefore, that Old Testament book must be late. And you'd say, well, no, that, that's not a good reason. But that's part of what we was very popular in German higher criticism. So just, just to be somewhat empirical, what do you mean by the late? Because the number we've got here is 167. Yeah. Well, in, in the, the system that uh, I think Jason is a fan of, is it Finkelstein? He's one of them. Yeah. Okay. Um, Finkelstein is the author that Jason seemed to be familiar with, but this became very popular with another scholar. I'm going to save his name for a little bit later. His initials are JW, he's not Joe's witness. Um, but in mentioning uh, this, this scholar, was very popular to say that uh, all the texts that were very theologically developed with ideas that we consider current currency with, for Judaism or Christianity today, if you found that in the Old Testament, then that's late. And by late, in this system that means in the Hasmonean period, the New Testamental period with the Maccabees. So around 160, that era. Okay. All right. So to clarify, okay, so there are there are references to heaven and hell, but as from what I have read, Daniel 12, 2 is the only one that specifically mentions a resurrection. And with resurrection, there is therefore something tied to that, and that's the afterlife. So here's a great. Oh, oh okay. So, so we're not going to do a Bible box. Okay. The, uh, as long as we understand each claim is not true because it's stated from the stage. Okay. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. That that's always the case. Just because it comes from here doesn't make it true. Especially if it's coming from me. Um, the uh, but so so um, you were you were close. Oh yeah. No, just just a quick note, just for an example, because it'll illustrate the point I said. Let's say Job, where he says, even though I know that worms are going to destroy my body and I'll be destroyed in the flesh, yet I in my flesh will be able to see God. Uh, and even though my body goes into the grave, I'll stand before him face to face. So that's a good example. That sounds like that. Sounds, sounds like, like But here's the answer I'll go ahead and give you. That must be a late text. Yeah, okay. So again, I'm not getting the... I, oh, well, I'm not one of the... You guys familiar with the uh, civil aviation or commercial aviation? The A380. It was about two and a half years late, right? We had people waiting in line to get this aircraft online, right? But who gives a shit? It's still a beautiful airplane. I'm not getting from you, Jason, the importance or the significance of the fact that these texts were late. They're still included in the canon. They're still part of the belief system. There were lots of why does, it, why does it matter? I really need to understand why it matters where they appear. Where they appear 
in the book or how they, how they appear chronologically? Yeah, chronologically, yeah. Okay. So let me just jump back quickly because I mentioned I would come back to why Daniel is where it is. So Daniel is, is widely regarded by scholars as being the last book written during this period of existential crisis around 167. Now, in the Hebrew order of the, of the text, Chronicles is actually last, but it's not in the Christian Old Testament. That is Malachi, right? Okay. Why is Malachi last? Why have the order of the books in the Christian Old Testament been shuffled? done for very specific reasons. That's because Malachi um, prophecies the return of Elijah. So that then leads into uh, the New Testament uh, and John the Baptist preaching in, uh, about Jesus. So it was a very uh, specific motivation to reorder that. So even though Daniel has been stuck in the prophets, it wasn't written in the time that all of the other prophets were and, and so how does that diminish its value? I'm not saying it diminishes its value. I'm saying context is important. Okay. Every book in the Bible was written at a specific point in time, generally as a response to some socio-political or religious crisis that was going on in their community at the time. So if you're going to understand it, you must understand it in the context of what was going on at the time it was written, which is why the, the Maccabean crisis of 167 is very key to what was going on in their society. Okay, so is it fair to say that if a theology is eternal, then existential crisis at any given time really shouldn't change the theology. Yeah. We shouldn't be adding should, new should ideas. Be the same. Right? We should maintain it all the time. As, right? as Bill Moore likes to talk about with the Vatican, this just in, you know, right. like the, the whole fish thing. Well, they, so just, they make it up as they go along. And that's what you feel about the book of Daniel. This is a, like, all of it. Not just the book of Daniel. I'm saying it's all. It's, it's right. all related to the context of what was happening in their societies at the times they were being written. From a Christian perspective, Jonathan, is there a concern about the time that these books are written, the order that they are presented? Um, so, in a, in a sense, no. And this is in terms of the, the the theory that's being put forward to this type of day, which I don't think, based on the evidence, is correct. And I can come back to that. So, the answer is no for that reason. But the answer, secondly, as what you said, is if, if the theology is there or the text is there, don't you have to deal with it as it stands? Which is also true, but in the, the Christian tradition, the Jewish tradition, sometimes we call the scriptures revelation. Revelation has the idea of an unveiling of something. You, you may hate it, you may like it, you may think it's foolish or true, but Christians were already uh, kind of agreed to the idea that God was gradually revealing uh, information. We start out with one book and we eventually get to 66. And again, you can you can hate all of it, but you can also create a straw man by saying Christians didn't know the scriptures came gradually. Christians didn't know that the theology developed. Well, I, I'm pretty sure they did if they thought about it, because really, as far as I know, I don't know any Christians who believe that a, a book dropped out of heaven. They understand that it has historical, archaeological ties and many of these other things. Now, there may be people who had that misunderstanding, but that's kind of a strong man to say that I, I would disagree. You see, there are, there are evangelical Christians in the U.S. who are pushing their social agenda based on the fact that the Bible is literally true and without error. That is their stated position. Okay, okay. but it's not yours. No. Okay. okay. Right. So yeah, we'll agree that there are some evangelicals who are using the Bible for their particular agenda, but that doesn't make them right or wrong. Right. So, but there are who. We do believe that the Bible was just revealed in its current form 4,000 years ago or whatever date they choose to. And so your goal is to make sure that your goal is to make sure that others don't also believe that. No, my goal is to, if, you, if your religion is going to be that important to you, that it runs your life, understand it. Because I run into people all the time. I got brought into a discussion uh, last week. A friend of mine in the Philippines, uh, there was a big debate about feminism and this uh, uh, Philippine woman chimed in with the uh, quote from Timothy about women should just be silent and obey their husbands. And she said, Jason, jump into this. And I did. And she's like, why are women always? Yay, Timothy. Yeah, I'm like, well, one, that's a forgery. If you read Romans and Corinthians, Paul's praising women. So which is it? Is Paul telling women to shut up or is Paul praising women? So read your Bible. Know what it actually says. So I think we found a point on which you and Jonathan probably agree at 100% level, right? Or 
if it's going into your faith, you should know about it. Right? Yes, right? Exactly. you should understand it, right? Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. So what's your response to that? It's yeah. like the, I saw a good meme on Facebook about the, the Apple agreement. So the Bible is just like the, the end user license agreement. Nobody reads it, they just click, I agree. <laughs> so, but I, I think this is helpful because the statement is no one reads the Bible. And then we have folks, and again, you can disagree with us or say you don't like us, but I can tell you that I read the Bible. Um, so that it's not a very strong claim, and I don't know that it helps your case to mock people in general when you may find that there's exceptions to the rules. And you, you may not like the exceptions, but they're still there. And again, the thing that's exciting about this is it's all very uh, fact-oriented and historical and touching on evidence. And it's not just some of the accusations about uh, faith. I know in the preface to your book you talk about how the Bible presents itself in a way that causes you to be anti-rational. But I think when we talk about the dating of these books, that can be exciting because this is something we share as skeptics is to say, well, let's talk about what the evidences are for these things. But how many Christians are actually doing that? How many are questioning and looking at the, the scholarship? I can only speak for myself, and I'm, I'm here to represent that minority, I guess. Or you would be a minority, you agree? No. No? Do um, you know many Christians that understand the scholarship? Yes. Where are they? Seminaries, universities, churches of the general populace, church-going populace. Uh, you I'm know, not talking scholars who are in the seminary school. I'm talking the general church. So Jason, it sounds like you have something very clever. Why don't you tell us the percentages? How many no, Christians? No, I, I don't know. I how many? Could, oh, you don't no, know. But I'm just saying. He's saying he's. You know, most Christians do. I'm like, well, most Christians. No, don't. I don't think he said most. He said there are lots who read the Bible. And I would agree with you, but I, I find the same thing though for uh, for our philosophy as well. Problem with my life. I talk to people who don't believe, who frequently don't have a clue what they're talking about, and they don't understand why they don't believe, and they don't they don't have the basis for it. But I think that's the case. And every organization in the world has people who are weak and don't understand the way they should. Just like in any religion, you've got people who are somewhere on the continuum of you know devout fundamentalists to I'm um, just like an armchair someday, you know, I go for an hour a week. And on that spectrum, they also have a different level of knowledge as well. So my contention, and a lot of scholars' contention, is that the average Sunday church-going Christian doesn't know the scholarship that we're talking about. Excellent. And that's why you're on stage, and they're in the audience. right? And what I want to do is I want to use your scholarship to undermine Christianity by explaining to us why the Bible in this particular idea of heaven and hell week. So let's move on to hell. When does hell first appear in the Bible? It's, it goes kind of hand in hand with the developments of heaven because during this existential crisis and they, they shift to their messianic uh, understandings of a messianic kingdom on earth to a messianic afterlife. The ideas of hell kind of go hand in hand with that because you know if I'm a good righteous Jew and I go to heaven why should you get it? You know or you or you you know you beat your kids, you beat your wife. What are we gonna do with them? So we got, we gotta figure something out. So can you give me a book and a time? Uh, the first in the New Testament, the first reference to hell is in Mark um, about pluck out thine eyes and lest the something like that. Probably quote that if I can. Um, so, but there are no references to hell in the Old Testament. Okay. Um, in, in the Old Testament, we've got a variety of terms that people usually understand as hell. The usual one. Uh, yes. Yeah, translated show. You know the first appearance of that? Yeah, but what, what was it originally? What did it come? Okay, so the first appearance of that is in Deuteronomy. And it's the idea of not just hell as a grave, which is where it very often is used as, but also an idea of punishment and burning that's there. So it's not just Deuteronomy, it's not. Okay, we'll leave it. Yeah, yeah. No, no Bible. Bible. Okay, no Bible, we say. Um, but uh, if you look at it, no, there's there's a reference there, and there's several others. Yeah, but the concepts well. of Shoal as a, as a shadowy netherworld exists in the Old Testament. But in the Old Testament, not once does hell show up as a place of punishment. Not once. Okay, that, that's a fairly strong claim. And I, I, I disagree, and I'd love to give examples. David says I can't use my no, Bible, but, but, use after, but after, no, no, but I, I mean, we can do it now, or we can do it afterwards. Deuteronomy, the first occurrence, you can look there. You can also look in Numbers to see the punishment aspect of it there. And again, these ideas aren't going to be likable or pretty, but that doesn't mean that they're not there. I mean, I don't know that it strengthens the argument to say that, um, 
just to dismiss that out of hand. I think it'd be better for your case, Jason, to say there are passages which are controversial. There are passages where people disagree. But just to say there are no passages is a bit of an overstatement. I'm just quoting the scholars on the Old Testament who say there are no passages in the Old Testament dealing with hell as a place of punishment. Uh, no, I'll let you do that. The, uh, okay, well, why is that important? Why does it matter if hell doesn't come until you say because it's Mark, a Christian invention? Oh, it can't be revealed. If you use the word invention, what sense of invention was that? Christian invention. So yes, in the intertestamental period, these ideas of Satan and hell are growing. In that period, by that time, the Old Testament canon is closed. So these ideas don't appear in the Old Testament. These are all things new. Paul makes no mention of hell. Pun eternal punishment does not enter into Paul's theology. He criticizes it now. I know he's going to say He calls his opponents satanic. But there's no mention of hell in his theology. Okay, so why is that important? Again, I mean, you, you're telling us... Well, if, if, it was, if it was all true, then why, why isn't the message consistent through all the books? Why is it in Genesis as it is in the Intertestament, as it is in Mark and Paul? And why isn't the message the same everywhere? Why is it evolving over time? But just because I'm hoping that some of you or all of you will pick up on threads through the discussion. Again, to the, the quick reference to say Paul never mentions it. There's explicit mentions in Second Thessalonians. So I hope by now you your guess. Not a legitimate book of Paul. That's what that's I was. That's what I was hoping you would start to pick up on. That whenever we have a statement, it's there are no or there is none. Or you will not find. Whenever it's suggested to say, well, it's here. The answer will be actually that was late or a forgery. And whenever you ask why, the scholarship is because it's a late doctrine. Because it's describing events that are after the time in which that person lived. That's how they know it's a forgery. And that Second Thessalonians is describing an era in which there is an organized church. Paul does not live in an era where there are churches. He's writing letters to individual communities. And whenever Paul would write to people, he, because he's writing in Greek, and he'd write to the ecclesia, which is the ones who are called out. You can maybe hear in that word ecclesia, the word for ecclesiastical, which has connotations of church. So when the Greek New Testament was written, and they use the word ecclesia, this is church. And Paul would say, I'm writing to the ecclesia at Philippi. I'm writing to the ones at Ephesus. They're not organized churches. They are small communities. So in Second Thessalonians, he's... So that they're writing about an organized church that doesn't exist in 50 CE. What's your definition of an organized church? Like we have today. Like you actually have brick and mortars with priests and bishops. And these are small individual communities of believers in the time of Paul. They're waiting for the end times in their lifetime. When did organized churches first appear? After the last apostle died in the first century. That's when they start showing up. And that's when Christian beliefs in heaven show up. So again, it, we, it will bog us down, but every statement you can be skeptical about and say, are there brick and mortars mentioned in Second Thessalonians? And probably you've got a free edition of the Bible. You can check that out for yourself. You don't have to take my word for it. Jason's or David's. No, no, not a brick and mortar uh, church. So I'm very interested, too, in the definition of, of what the church is. It's no surprise that for a long time, these were small groups. I think everybody knows and agrees historically it was an era of persecution. You can read about it in the New Testament documents, but you can also read it in the history of the world and the early church fathers. You weren't going to have giant basilicas, which was a government property, until after that persecution had ended. So it's no wonder if they were small groups at first, and that's not a mystery or it's not something we were hiding. In the New Testament, there's a little phrase that says, these things were not done in a corner. So it sounds good to make it a conspiracy, but it's... You're picking up the persecution and conspiracy. It was nowhere near as widespread as you're trying to make it sound. I didn't say anything about the threat. Yeah, um, just existence. Um, okay, so here's the question that I have for you, John. How important are the concepts of uh, heaven and hell in your uh, in your theology, and within your church, within your parishioners? How often do these issues actually, or, or those two concepts, come up? And, and are any motivational in any way? No, absolutely. David's uh, asking about how often these concepts are used and they come up. And in the sphere of theology, which is encompassing a lot of things, we say it's cover encompassing everything in life, there's obviously some times when this would be appropriate and inappropriate to talk about. Um, and so the times that probably a lot of you can imagine being appropriate, we use them. And again, uh, I don't expect everybody to like it or think it's, you know, 
taste for anything. But in times whenever people are reading the scriptures, as Jason's done himself and others have done, when it comes up into the text, because our church is expository, and that means we preach through all the books of the Bible, when it occurs in the text, we investigate it. We break it apart, see what it means, connect it to other scriptures, and so we teach on it. And we say, here's this thing in the scriptures, and here's how we believe it impacts your life. So that's one way it encroaches into our theology. And in there are other times there are moments when I sit down in the philosophy club and we're staying long after and somebody looks at you and say, but you really believe in that horrible, offensive, et cetera, et cetera. Blah, blah, blah. And I, I have to say yes, as a biblically you know, based Christian. I do, right? We talked about this as well. So it comes up in those situations. And then when I visit folks who are sick or who we know are going to be dying, and again, you don't have to like it or agree, but certainly have it comes into that discussion. We talk about it in terms of comfort, peace, and rest, and many of those things as well. Um, so it comes up in a variety of ways. Um, it's not always the way that somebody enters into these systems, right, to where they become a believer or they become converted, um, but sometimes it does there. So uh, my simple answer is yes, it comes up, usually when it's appropriate, and we don't fixate on either of these, because that would be a bit strange. And I do think there are groups that fixate on one or the other, and that's where they spend most of their time talking about. But for us, one of the principles we aim for in our church, and we're different from other churches, and we're made up of individual people which are different from others, is that we really try to address things in the proportion that they're done in the scriptures, in the whole corpus of scripture, which means in a challenging way, we've got to be aware of what the scriptures look like proportionately. So I hope that's yeah, getting yeah, there. That's, that's cool. Why do you believe in hell as a place to punish you? Why do I believe that? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, that's a really good question. I'll let you answer it. But yeah. then I have another question about what you just said. Yeah. Well, oh, you're going to ask me Yeah. So the reason I believe it is the, the same reason for why I believe a lot of other things that I haven't seen with my eyes. And that's because I am uh, a believer in Jesus Christ and I have strong faith in God. Um, and I can give reasons for that. I'll, I'll say in passing with this, I'm a little hesitant to go into detail because in your book you had already said you don't want to hear people talk about their relationship with Jesus Christ. I'd like to do that. I don't have any qualms about talking about this relationship with God. But uh, that's really what it is. You you can talk about it in terms of, uh, we could say, deductive reasoning and inductive reasoning. Um, Most of us here tonight are fans of inductive reasoning, right? Where we're trying to, to, to look at things, we can say empirically, trying to assess some things. So for me, um, I was told a story. I was told information at a point in my life uh, where, and I, when I was told it by people who were believable, I believed it. So I began to check it as I got older, and the more I checked it, the more I studied, the more affirmed and confirmed I was in it. And I'm, again, happy to share those things as well. Um, that being said, uh, after. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Um, that being said, it's a part of my belief system, and it's a belief system that's been confirmed many times in many ways. And I'm going to put on the philosopher's shoes here for a second. We all have belief systems, every single one of us, and we can talk about the rigors and scrutiny that we put those things to, but we all have them. And there are ways for each of those different belief systems for us to try and pick them apart and analyze them. David and I have had a running joke about self-consciousness. Self-consciousness and consciousness is a really tricky, slippery issue to, to talk about. Our David's got down pat since he's come back, right? So there are things about that that are hard for us to uh, to really nail down all the different parts of it, but we wouldn't make fun of one another for believing some of those things. Probably the majority of people in the room believe they're conscious right now. Some don't, uh, but others do. Um, but So anyway, so no, I don't have to make any bones about saying it's part of my belief system. And I'm happy to justify that, but it would probably take a lot of time. Yeah, and absolutely it would. I mean, it, it, it's a legitimate question. I knew there was going to be a long answer to it. Um, but I, I want to go back to what you had said before. Um, about the importance, the proportional importance of scripture, and that's a great way to approach it. Um, at any time, ever, is there a discussion about the kind of things that Jason is talking about, where you know the, the, the evidence for, or the substantiation for, particular theological practices aren't there in the Bible, or aren't there in the way that some scholars claim they are? I mean, does that ever happen to the church? And in the way that Jason says, we need to educate Christians about their own theology, just a yes or no. I'm confused. Three states. So um, Jason, Jason's taking a fairly significant claim here. He's saying that heaven and hell are not significant issues within the scripture. And that they come very late. And they're almost afterthoughts. And they're reactions to situations that were happening on the ground. 
hey guys, we've got to change theology. We're getting slaughtered here. Better promise something big. Right? That kind of reaction. Is there ever any talk like that within your church, within your community? Yeah, absolutely. There is. Yeah, and to, yeah, to do you address those issues. Do you think there's any legitimacy to the scholarship that makes those claims? His claims or the, the claims the, the uh, both. Okay. No, I, I think before before we have evidence, a lot of things can be to a skeptic, to an unbeliever, they can be fair game, right? If somebody makes a claim about something, it can be fair game. But when we have evidence and we have uh, facts about a situation uh, in, in the scriptures, then we can talk about that, and we do. Uh, so, and there's some folks here who have been to my church, and they've heard me from the pulpit saying, hey, you know, this city in the scriptures in the 1800s, people made fun of it and said this actually doesn't exist. It's only in the Bible. This is why the Bible is wrong. Now they found it archaeologically. Isn't that interesting? The Bible was correct when many people thought it wasn't. So we address it in, in that way. Is that your question, or do you mean it does the text it address no, itself? No, no, okay. That's exactly what that is. So, so Jason, I have a question. Honestly. So I have uh, good question. Good question. Honesty is not something I'm interested in. I'm um, interested in evidence. I like evidence a lot more than honesty. Um, what was that? There's a quote from House, uh, rational arguments don't work on religious people. Is yeah, that's right. No, it, I, the quote from House is, you can't rationally argue someone out of a position that you irrationally got into. But my question for you, Jason, because uh, you asked Jonathan a great question, why don't you believe in heaven and hell? Because I can see that these were late doctrines that were made up as they went along, two reactions to things, and I want to ask Jonathan as well. Oh, wait, wait, wait. No, because no, I'm not, 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 that's not going to follow up to that. That's it? No, because... That's the reason you don't believe in if, heaven if hell? If there is a loving God, because why would he punish people for eternity? Well, that's a better question. So that's what I want to ask Jonathan. You believe in hell, but you believe in a loving God. So where's the where's the cognitive dissonance? Do you believe in this loving God who punishes people for eternity? Now we're getting somewhere. But I've know. lived on this planet for 60 years. I'm going to be punished for eternity because I masturbated in the bathroom like what kind of thinking is that? <laughs> you know, you first saw that, Jason. Uh, no, um, do, you want, do you want to take that question? Yeah, just, John, Jason, listen, I'm trying to give you airtime here, but you keep asking Jonathan questions that he knows the answers to. Right? Do you want, do you no, want I just, to I want to know why he believes in hell. Why he believes in hell. He why. He has yeah. already answered that question. Because but, he, but somebody reason, told him to believe it. So but now but yeah, just, I just told me to believe it. I just want to make sure that, that I'm summarizing what, what you just said. And that is that you don't believe in heaven and hell because the scripture is weak. I just don't believe in heaven and hell because it's, it's obvious that this was a man made reaction. In any religion, it's a man made doctrine. Okay, ask me. That's why you want. Yeah. I don't have to ask you. I know you don't care. <laughs> so, David, why? Why don't you? Because there's no evidence. Okay, so to, to uh, I will, I'll, I'll go light on the second answer, but to the first one, just because the key phrase late is coming up again, and, and we'll try and put it to rest and put it to bed for the majority of the folks here. I don't think for Jason or I it will be put to rest, but we can see. So again, because Jason's already mentioned it, we've talked about Daniel being a late date, 167, and I said this is a very common thing. It's very popular. Um, but what's troublesome is when you look at the evidence, as far as I know, and I'd like to hear more um, from Jason in just a moment, um, the reason why people say it's late is because of the theology, right? Here's a, a developed doctrine, the afterlife people say, so it must be late. That, that seems like an arbitrary reason. Over against that, the date of 167 is troublesome now because some of you have heard of the Dead Sea Scrolls and the Qumran community. When they uncovered the Dead Sea Scrolls, you'll know that this was overlapping the same period as the Maccabees and the Hasmoneans. And so when they located this, if the theory about Daniel being so late was true, Daniel would be separate from the other documents, and it probably wouldn't be in there because it's the same period. But in the Dead Sea Scrolls, Daniel was already a part of the, the codices. It was already a part of the documents, which means it was already a part of the accepted scriptures before the 167th date that, they, that uh, Jason gave. How much? Uh, uh, less. The so are also very late. Without, without a question, less than 50 years. But most people say already there before. The second part of this is when we discover the Dead Sea Scrolls, you can't explain away the type of writing as being a late edition as well, right? So we found a manuscript in the 11th century. We could say, well, they changed the writing to make it look Persian. But the writing in the Dead Sea Scrolls community was written during a time when the Greeks, the Hellenists, which Jason mentioned, were controlling the area. 
And the Aramaic there is not written with Greek terms about the government. It's written with Persian terms, which is when Daniel had purported to be written by. And there were Persian terms that people were skeptical about until they found them confirmed in what's called the imperial Persian dialect. So um, the reason I'm mentioning this is, and you can look at it and say, I still don't buy it. That's fine, but what I'm trying to say to all of you is the accepted scholarship, because these are archaeological finds, are towards an earlier date of Daniel, and certainly against this view as proposed by other scholars like Finkelstein and some of the rest. So now it's the chance to say, well, do I date it late because I find the theology inconvenient, or do I date it earlier because all the evidence demands that I do so? That's the question that any of us can ask. You don't have to be a Christian or a non believer about that. This is trying to weigh the evidence and trying to be rational about it. Uh, but the, the Essene community was also contemporary with Jesus as well. Uh, so I don't, I don't know if there's a hard and fast date of when they first appeared and when they went extinct. But th this is all taking place you know, around the time of say 200 BCE up through say 50 CE. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, so the, the book of Daniel could have been written and incorporated by the Essene community. But, but these aren't, um, this is not if the, the world is flat or if we really walked on the moon. We can actually check and see that people have dated the materials with radiocarbon dating. dating. They also have textual scholars who are not all believers saying these are the dates of the documents. And these things are what we call peer review. And trust me, because I have to go through this for journal submissions. You send out your information to the world of scholarship. Everybody is not the same belief that you have, and they assess it and decide if it's right or it's wrong, if, if the evidence supports it. That's what they did. It's, it's not just some crazy pastor up on the stage throwing this out. So you can say, yes, the Essene community extended for a long time. We could probably find some Jewish sects that are similar to the Essenes even now, but that's a separate issue from the dating of the manuscripts. So which, which what date did this manuscript from the receives? When, when did they date it? For Daniel, they dated it from, I believe it was 160. The, the reason I kind of smiled when you said 167, because that's really inconvenient. I was going to give it 50 years. It was, as I remember, I've got it written down. It was within 150 years of the beginning of the Maccabean period. But the date was 160, one of them was. And that's more inconvenient for the Maccabean hypothesis than even what I was willing to give. Because you're always trying to give your opponent the benefit of the doubt and say, well, it could be this. You know, balance what you want to say. Um, but it's not looking good for that time. So it's around 160. So what's the later? No. So it could have been written in 167, and by 160 it's been included by the Essenes. So the argument's in my favor. No, no, not for I don't know if anybody here does studies in history, but seven years um, is, is not the amount of time to get something invented and then put into the accepted Jewish uh, canon of Scripture. Uh, this is just a, a, a given. I'm not saying it was accepted by the Jewish canon. I'm saying by that point, within seven years, the Essenes had accepted it into their theology. That's all the point I'm jumping on. You may. I'm not saying it was accepted by the Jews as a, as a canon. I'm just saying it only took seven years for the Essenes to go, oh, hey, this, this kind of jives with what we believe. We're, we're going to take this. But I, I, I'm not quite sure about how this is, this is a problem. Daniel still comes before the Essenes did it. No, no, what we were saying is they're, they're dating the document within, I was going to say within 50 years, right? Uh, now we're saying within a decade according to Jason's dates. And historically, you don't look at these time overlaps and say that it was invented during that period. For instance, we have Caesar's writings. There's a gap of about 1,500 years. We have about 10 manuscripts. There's a whole lot of time there for us to say somebody invented this. But as historians, we say that's artificial, that's arbitrary. Unless you have evidence, apart from an argument from silence, you don't just pick a date when you think it's convenient to invent a story. So I'm not, I'm not picking a date. I mean, this is what scholars are saying. This is when the Maccabean Revolt and the Seleucid Crackdown took place roughly in this period. And it was around 167 that Daniel was written coinciding with these events. Okay. So the Essene community would have been going through the same ship storm and would have gone, oh crap, this, this writing you know, kind of appeals to what we think. And you're saying no. No, I, I'm, I'm saying no. I mean, we can, we can say it many times, but unless you have evidence for it, you, we can say yeah. a lot of Can we do the same thing with the entire Bible? Um, probably, as we took the time tonight, we could do it for a lot more than you would expect, but uh, I could say this. Uh, we can do it for the Bible 
many, many more times over than we can for any other piece of ancient literature. And that's not a, a biased or controversial statement. It's a recognized statement because it's been part of the culture for two or three years. So, for instance, uh, Jason likes the name Diogenes of Mayberry. And I was excited because I thought you were from North Carolina. <laughs> Mayberry is based off of North Carolina where all those idiots are from. That's where I'm from. Right? So Jason calls himself Diogenes of Mayberry. And I believe this is uh, Alpha Diogenes of Sinope, right? Yeah. Senate? Okay. So but Mayberry, because I, I was writing during the, the Obama uh, first presidential when uh, McCain and the, the Christian right kept harping on small town American values, small town American values. So that's what yeah, Mayberry popped Yeah, a good analogy would be, it'd be like me being St. Paul of Toronto. Um, so Diogenes of Mayberry, when you talk about Diogenes, you look at who he is. Diogenes himself, we don't have any ex extant existing writings of Diogenes. We don't have uh, anything from his hand. We have it written by Diogenes Laertes, who is living a century after Diogenes. And we could concoct a conspiracy, right? To say the later Diogenes wanted more fame for his name. And so he's the one who wrote Diogenes the Cynic. And then we say that truly we only have three manuscripts. They all came to us in the 12th century of Diogenes. One is in Paris, one is in Florence, one is in uh, I believe Venice, okay? And they come to us in the 12th century. So in this, you've got a whole lot of flex and play to create a conspiratorial theory about why and when and who wrote Diogenes and how it was to resist the Florentian traders and a lot of things like that. But it's just not legitimate in history to do that unless there is something explicitly saying, this is why it was a forgery, this is why it was written. And with Daniel, they always say is we don't like it. we don't like the afterlife being so early in the Hebrew scriptures. It sure would be nice if we could put it in the Maccabean period. Therefore, we say it's written in the Maccabean period. And there's got to be something else buttressing that. There, there could be some linguistics in the text itself. I mentioned the the Persian language versus the Hellenist. There could be manuscript evidence. There could be a lot of other things, and we just don't have that. So I'm okay with coming up with all kinds of stories, but it would be encouraging for your case if there was some strong evidence to back it up, other than higher criticism based on inconvenient theology. Where is your evidence to prove that I'm wrong? Uh, the, the, onus, the onus is on the person making the claim. Version, uh, the version, yeah, I think he's already being through it, Jason. And, and your, your claim is that, that the scripture is in response to the events. Um, and, it is, and is there any evidence to indicate that it is other than correlation? I mean, these events that the the, the date that you put on the scripture is at the same time as these. That's uh, if you like that the, the textual criticism that's been done on all the passages shows very clearly that a lot of the stories, a lot of the books are very, very contextually related to the events that are going on. They're very much a correlation to what's happening in their society. A correlation. There's no evidence. We can't go, we don't have time to go back. Right. Okay, excellent. But the, the only other counterpoint is, uh, well, it says so, therefore, to believe it. That's not a very skeptical way of looking at it. You, you, John, you, you've, already, you've already done your work. You've yeah. done your work. Okay, thank you very much, guys. Um, give these guys a round of applause for my finished chef. Uh, now we'll go to questions. I have a couple more questions for you, but I'm going to save them to the end. We'll wrap it up in a few minutes. But now is when we go to the audience. So it's a Q&A. Anybody out there for anybody up here? Sir, uh, I have a question. The dichotomy of heaven and hell is an appealing symmetry, but why is it necessary to have both? Can you believe in one but not the other? Can you accept one not the other? For example, maybe I believe uh, that there is no heaven, there is only a hell. Why can't you have both? Why can't I just accept one? That's a human response. Right? Uh, it's that uh, the German Schadenfreude. You know, I take the light and the punishment of those around me. So. Yes, you could theoretically have just a heaven and God is going to be all loving and forgiving and we all go there, but we're not. Um, what the next yeah. Okay, so I guess I don't, I don't really know the answer to the necessary part of it, but heaven and hell are, as Jonathan said a few minutes ago, an important part of the Christian theology. Um, and it's generally not considered a cafeteria, right? I mean, you don't go up to the buffet and take a little of this and a little yeah. of that. If you're a Christian and you believe in the Bible, then it's pretty much necessary. Um, you, you can't take little bits that you like and leave the other parts behind. Um, why, why, as a Christian, why would you want to divide it up? It doesn't make sense to me. You can, sir, believe in whatever you like. If you'd like to go home tonight believing there's a heaven and no hell, 
or maybe your objective was to go the other way around. I'm not sure, but that wouldn't be Christianity. There's a good quote I have from Rabbi David Wolpe from the uh, Sinai Temple in Los Angeles. Uh, when I was researching, I did a lot of, I emailed a lot of these scholars, and he's one of them. Uh, and he says that there's a, a compassionate Christian Catholic bishop that I know. And this goes back to, to Jonathan's point about having to believe in hell because it's, it's there. And he says, I'm required by doctrine to believe in hell. However, I'm not required to believe anyone is actually there. Why is it necessary that Sure, no, I think I think David spoke as a great Christian there uh, <laughs> in reference to the scripture. So that's that's one very simple answer is to say that for a certain species of Christian, they're dedicated to whatever the Bible tells them. Right? So that takes care of one aspect. But no, to your question, certainly there's there are a plethora of people who don't believe in both. There's some who uh, do believe in both, and then there's some who believe in one or the other. There's plenty of folks who believe just in heaven alone. I don't know if you want to take the French existentialist Jean-Paul Sartre literally, but he said hell is other people. And so he believed he was living in hell, and everybody else was too. So no, there's a lot of people who do that. Um, a lot of folks uh, get rid of the idea of hell because it's very offensive. But no, um, David already answered it. For a species of Christian, we believe it because it's written in God's word, and we have other reasons for believing in God's word. Uh, do Mormons believe in hell? Yeah, well, sort of. Sort of. Okay, we'll get the sort of answer later. Okay, excellent. Next. Go, uh, can I save you for the end? I know, it's just a short question. Go ahead, go ahead, Rashi. Why Christianity is considered a monothe uh, monotheistic religion? Why is it not a polytheistic religion? And are you referring to, like, the saints and that sort of thing? No, no, I mean, uh, what I'm referring to explicitly is uh, the Trinity concept. Oh, okay, okay. So... You know, you have a God that exists in three different forms. But then, like, these gods, they don't, they act independently from each other. Right, sure. How important is it, too, yeah. as well? I'd like to know, uh, why is it because matter if it's polytheistic or monotheistic? Yeah, because in terms of why it matters, again, I, I say because... I'm told that it matters, right? And again, I go ahead and committed myself to the system of theology, which I believe for various reasons from the Bible. But in the Bible, it presents this idea, which I agree with you, is quite challenging and confusing, right? And we can talk about it a long night uh, to hear, but because the Bible presents both. The Bible is quite explicit in the Old and the New Testaments. It says you have one God, but then it also talks about this one God existing eternally in three persons. And you say, well, that sounds confusing. Is it three gods? No. Is it one person? No. And again, I'm agreeing with you. This is quite confusing. But there's a, a the reasons from the scripture, and there's theology to explain how and why. And we can talk about it. I don't know if it's going to serve the point. But again, the reason for the importance is because that's how we're told that who we're told that God is. When we look at things, we say to ourselves in two senses: Does this correspond to reality? We can test those things and look at them. And then we secondly say: Does it make sense rationally within? And this Trinity idea is one that really stretches the mind rationally. But if it so happens that there is a God, he gets to be any kind of God he wants to be. And we've resigned ourselves to that. That's, That's, another, example. Example. That's another example of theology evolving, because the early Christians didn't believe in Trinity. This comes about later. The, the, the codification of the doctrine of the Trinity comes about in 324, 300 years later. And it's only in Christianity today because they wanted the Council of Nicaea. And, and do you think this undermines the validity of theology? Yes. Because these ideas come later. Because it's not consistent. If, if it was truly the revealed word of God, it would be consistent throughout time in every book. And it's not. And I, I want to just come back to one point. Um, you say you believe in hell because you're told to believe it, but then you just said it's offensive. So if it's an offensive concept, why don't you challenge what you believe? Okay, that's an excellent question, which you're not going to get to answer, because it's the audience's turn. Okay, we'll come back to it. All right, go ahead, audience, right here. In, in a broader sense, and just limiting it to Judeo-Christian beliefs, in, in taking religions in their thousands across the planet, how common are heaven and hell? Are the, is it something that almost every religion has an equivalent? Yeah. In the polytheistic religions, there are God like Kali and Shiva. You have gods and goddesses of destruction, but they're not evil. Only in a monotheistic religion do you have to have blame for God. Or blaming, you can't blame God for evil. Therefore, you must have a polar opposite to project onto. So in the polytheism, uh, the, the 
what would be considered a, the goddess or goddess of destruction isn't considered evil. Just answer, yeah, but, but, but just answer my question. Um, within Buddhism, I mean, or, or, or the concept of reincarnation, I mean, you're going to be reincarnated as a flea. I, mean, I, I think that's meant to be their form of hell. And if you're going to get to Nirvana, that's their form of heaven, right? So I mean, it's 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 there within a lot of um, theologies and philosophies that you wouldn't think it was there. Yeah, you know, just just to affirm what David's saying is, and again, what Jason's saying is quite confident and bold. But you you can check it for yourself. You can do a study of uh, philosophy of religion. This semester, I'll be teaching philosophy of religion uh, in Kowloon Tong at one of the universities. Um, there are plenty of other religions that believe in hell as well. East Asia, you have the later Buddhist development, but even the early ones as it comes from India, you have a belief in hell, and you have even depictions, paintings on caves and manuscripts and documents. And this is so far separate from the Middle East, there's no chance for people to complain, can say there's some kind of conspiratorial collusion going on here. So no, there's a lot of other religions that have ideas of heaven and hell. So, so it's been a common element in developing a religion to have the idea that of rewards and punishments that you never actually have to deliver on. Yeah, um, I, I think that's a, a long-standing concept in religion, is this idea that um, we need to explain what happens next. And some explanations have gotten fairly elaborate, and others have been fairly simple. But people often refer to Christianity as a cult of death. And it's this whole idea that what happens to us when we die, or when we end this life, right? So it's, it's, it's very, very common to try and explain it. Well, and you can have a promise for good behavior. Uh, not so much. And that, that does happen, but... Um, well, that hell, in the Christian idea of hell is a doctrine of terror. Um, as I mentioned just briefly earlier, the earliest Christians living in the time of Paul believed that the kingdom of heaven is coming in their lifetime. There was no need for heaven and hell because the kingdom was coming. If you read Mark 9, you know, ye shall not taste death till my father's kingdom has come. They don't believe in an afterlife. They don't believe in heaven and hell. They're waiting for it to come in their lifetime. When the last apostle dies and no big fireworks, that's when Christianity starts evolving to the, the idea that just like Judaism, the messianic kingdom is in the afterlife. It's a response. It's a reaction to a reality. Okay, uh, another audience question. I'll go and make Jason answer first this time so you can respond. Go ahead, Steve. Um, I'm seeing contrasts of words. A lot of times kingdom of God gets uh, switched with heaven, and, and but Jesus often refers to the kingdom of God. And I've heard both Jason and Jonathan referring to the Bible as the word of God. Jason obviously denying and, and making uh, issue of consistency. It's interesting, the Bible never refers to itself as the word of God. It refers to Jesus as the word of God. And it, I'm constantly amazed where the the... The arguments often get centered on the validity of the Word of God, and yet the Bible itself never refers to itself as the Word of God. It only refers to Jesus as the Word of God. Okay, so the guys in the back, did you hear, did you hear what Steve said? Okay, so I'll repeat it and just make sure I say it right. Uh, Steve is concerned about the fact that Jason's making claims that evangelical Christians say the Bible is the Word of God, the Bible is the Word of God. And, uh, and, and, and you have said something similar as well. You talked about the kingdom of God. But in fact... Is it true, guys, that nowhere in the Bible does the Bible proclaim itself to be the Word of God, but instead refers to Jesus Christ as the Word of God? Well, he's referred to as the Word in John. Um, one of the final quotes I used in the after of my book is one of the Old Testament scholars uh, I used a lot. Uh, it was John Collins, who's a professor of the Old Testament at Yale. And he says this monstrous imposition on the Bible that we shouldn't criticize. You know, look, if Jacob argues with God and wrestles with God and numerous other examples of people questioning the word of God. So it's this modern uh, concept of theology in today's world that the Bible's off limits. We're not supposed to critique the Quran. Uh, he says nowhere in the Bible does it say that. that you know, it's, it's fair game in the Old Testament for people to, to challenge, challenge God. But the kingdom was, was a concept that uh, rather than heaven, that God's kingdom would be manifest here on earth. And Jesus himself said, look around you, the kingdom is now. But the, 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 the gospels are slightly different in their terms in each one. Mark says that the kingdom of you shall not taste death. Matthew says the, the kingdom of 
God is within you, or Luke says the kingdom of God is within you, and Matthew is something that's in you. So working our way backwards from Jason to you, the, uh, in, in terms of uh, arguing or wrestling with God or being upset with God or even back to the other question of finding things offensive, again, yes, that, that, I think that's a part of a, a, a living or more realistic faith, and it's evidence in the scriptures where people who have this belief in God also find themselves arguing with them and trying to figure out why things are happening. But that's a distinct issue in terms of adding to or taking away from God's word or criticizing it. And this is bringing us back to your question. Um, I, I'm sure I did say word of God. I know I said canon. I know I said the word corpus. And these are just terms to refer to the body of scripture. There's another term. Scripture is another. The Bible uses terms like scripture, the law, the writings, the prophets. And these are there are various Greek and Hebrew words underlying those. But no, certainly in the Old Testament and New, there are there are uh, places where the Scripture is referring to itself. If there are passages where it says, "Make sure nobody adds to this. Make sure no one takes away from it." Jesus was fond of saying, "If somebody's coming to you and they're bringing some information, what you do is search the Scriptures and find out if these things are actually so." So that's referring back to the Scriptures as well. Um, so they do refer to themselves, and whether they refer to themselves as the Word of God doesn't mean that they weren't ever thought of as a unit, that they weren't approved of of one another. Uh, Peter has some very interesting writings, and some that are hard to understand, but so does Paul. And Peter refers to Paul as well, and he says, listen, people are taking Paul's words, and they're mixing them up, and they're confused about it, and they do this just like they do all the other scriptures. So you've got this you know, intertextual reference as well. So it's there, but I, I agree with you, you're right. We don't have it in the same, you know, no, nowhere is there the Holy Bible referred to in the Bible, but that's, that's to be expected, I think. Oh, thank you, guys. Mr. Uh, David, can I add something? No, you already went, man. Let's get <laughs> A little else. bit. Let's get somebody else. Somebody else. That's a good question. Come on, come on, follow Go ahead. Jason. Um, why does it matter if I believe in heaven or hell at all? Do you? Because as you said, hell is considered a doctrine of terror. He used the word offensive. So it's offensive to me that people are going through life terrified of a non existent place. Just doctrine of, of terror that's used to punish people. I find that personally offensive, that people have had this inflicted upon. Um, one of the examples I use, and um, Sam Harris uses it, I think in uh, Letter to a Christian Nation. Uh, in 2007, the Catholic Church finally repealed this idea that babies who aren't baptized go to hell, after like decades of research, because apparently the Catholic Church has nothing better to do than sit around and debate whether babies go to hell or not. And you can think, how many parents through the last, because this came about through uh, St. Augustus, so around 400. So you think like the last 1,500 years, how many parents suffer needlessly because their children died before they were baptized? And that I find really, really offensive, that these people were put through that. So that is why I care about you, because you're my friend. Do you want to talk to that answer as well? Good answer. Yeah, just to, to hop in on that as well, I, I'm, I'm pleased that Jason had mentioned uh, Augustine. I'm not quite sure that that's where that belief began, but it's very helpful because the doctrine, the doctrine of original sin came from uh, St. Augustine. The, the, what Jason was talking about with the baby in hell and things like that being offensive, I agree. Again, once as, as well, but it's not in the scriptures. And we're talking about the view of the afterlife in the scriptures. So. Again, I think I commiserate with the answer, but it's a bit um, off topic to, to bring that up. So I, so I can understand it being offensive in general, but it's, it's an odd illustration. Of it's the sure. Augustine was promoting his, his doctrine of original sin. He was challenged by another bishop, well, what if babies go to hell? Augustine had backed himself into a theological corner and said, well, then they go too. And that's where the idea of um, purgatory and limbo come. The, the Catholic Church starts evolving all of these get out of jail free cards. It was only in 2007 they finally went, the hope for a Baptist or an infant's baptism. It's just ridiculous. So follow up. I mean, I, I don't understand why you're getting so upset about something that you don't believe in. When it's not because true, you do. Right? No, but I'm, what, from an atheistic point of view, I'm just dancing to my DNA, right? I've just been determined to think this way. So why am I to blame? I don't know. Well, you. you're getting mad. No, I'm passionate about it because I like, see people suffering. I see people going through this needless uh, emotional torment that they're going to go to hell for eternity if they've done something wrong. But it's not real. Yeah, I know it's not real, but no, you guys think it's real, and I find that offensive. You mean you don't believe it's real? <laughs> I'm 
atheist on that, or agnostic on that point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, excellent. All right, good question. Thank you. Uh, go ahead. Just because that's like a whole night, right? We're not, we're not going to talk about the source of morality if it's outside the Bible. It could be, that could be a very, unless you've got a 20 second answer. Okay? Um, but the first part of your question was how does justice come into the concept of heaven and hell? Yeah. No, it, it's, it's absolutely there. Again, whenever we were mentioning earlier, I said I have other reasons for believing it, but the, the, I gave that primary one. You know, for us as Christians, it does make sense that there's a heaven and a hell because we do have an idea of there being justice and it being God's justice. And I think where some people would be able to understand this is when you look at people who live their life in a very horrible way, doing things that most of us would agree are, are wrong by any measure. And David and I have talked about this too because we differ on morality, but we both agree there are some things that seem like they should be punished and seem like they are wrong. Um, so, no, for Christians as well, we see this as an example of God's divine justice. There are some situations where in which people are not receiving the punishment that we believe, or people believe, or God deserves, believes they deserve, and that's where we find it in the afterlife, in this eternity of hell. So, justice is actually a very large feature in this, and it's also one of the reasons why Christians are able to live such a very strange way in terms of the afterlife, because I'm willing to say, listen, I'll help you out, I'll do whatever I can for you, I may disagree with you, Things you say may bother me or be offensive, but I'd like to be a friend to you and be as kind as I can because I'm not looking for any kind of earthly reward or help or thing. In fact, I'm not looking one for heaven. Like Dave and I have talked about this as well. But we have the idea that we're able to cheer coup. We're able to eat bitterness during this life because we know this life is not all that there is. And again, you can say it's foolish or laugh at it, but justice is certainly rolled into our idea of the afterlife. And morality as well in the fact that if we're going to be moral beings, we have to have freedom. And that's also why God has the idea of a heaven and a hell, because he's not creating robots. Um, there are people he desires to choose for him or against him. Again, that, that goes back to the hell as a concept of where, if we're righteous, we get to go to heaven, so where do we put the other people? So as, as Jonathan was mentioning, the concept of shoal exists in Judaism, but it wasn't a place of punishment. It was just where everybody went. You just blinked out of existence. And this was kind of the, the shadow lands. And as the ideas of heaven and hell are developing, this concept of Shoal sort of takes all of the characteristics of the underworld. And then the, uh, the burning garbage pit, Gehenna, uh, outside of Jerusalem, becomes sort of the portal to the underworld. So, yeah, there is this concept of justice. And that's human nature. He was asking earlier, why can't you just have one without the other? Because we're humans. And, you know, we have this concept of punishment and schadenfreude, so yeah. But based on your answer for the last question, you definitely don't believe that heaven and hell are I don't believe it, but are, are that's got nothing to do with justice. What, what, why should we, I'm coming back to my point, why do you need to be punished for eternity? Why, if you did something bad for one second out of 60 years of life, should you be punished for eternity? It like a long time. time. How long is eternity? I mean, you're talking more you than a year. Ha, ha, ha. Misogynist. Okay. Um, all right. Great. So now I have a question for you, Jonathan, because you just said something that. Um, well, let's go back to um, the fact that I'm not a Christian, but I do believe that if I'm going to criticize or if I'm going to make comments about Christianity, I got to know the game and the stuff. I've got to know the doctrine. My understanding of Christian Christianity is that it's already done. I mean, I don't have to be a good person in this life in order to get into heaven. Is that not true? Okay, good. Just to clarify that. I can be whoever the F I want in this world, but if I believe Jesus Christ is the one true Savior, there's, there's okay, also explain, explain why that doesn't work because that might be a misunderstanding that there's I have. also Christian denominations that believe you're predestined it doesn't matter how good of a person you are you're either condemned to, to heaven or hell no matter what you did well, that's no good that's not motivational and again to, to Jason's comment no no to my yeah, yeah. there's all kinds of Christians I can only speak for myself so sure. the answer I'm giving is, is 
uh, like, can I be whoever I want as yeah. long as I believe in Jesus Christ is what you say? Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. I, I, I think on one sense of this, or one side of the coin, you're going to be whoever you are, right? Uh, you are who you are. Yeah. But, uh, you know, that you're, you're partly there in teaching that, yes, for, for us as Christians, we understand that Jesus Christ has already accomplished our salvation. When we use the term salvation, right, it's, it's finished, it's done, it's accomplished. That being said, it's in reference to all that we've done, all that we are, and all that we will be. So that's a good thing to say about it. Because, again, I don't expect everybody or very many people in the room to agree with this, but in Christian theology, we have this idea of a moment in time where there's this person, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who dies on the cross for our sins so that we can have new life and have resurrection along with them. That was done in the past. So just thinking about that, neither you nor I were there, right? So everything was done in anticipation of who we are, will be, or will do, right? So, uh, so that's there, and that's part of your question. But we also have this idea in our theology as well, that when someone does understand this, they, they're able to believe the evidence and commit themselves to this, and they accept Jesus Christ as their Savior, and all that goes along with that, which I'm, I'm not going to preach an evangelistic meeting right now, but all of that happens, that there really is a change that happens in that person, their personality, their life, their lifestyle. And so then we say in Christian theology that you should be able to see a gradual change and progression in that person. And so that's why I say, no, if somebody says they're a Christian, they go around killing, you know, raping, ste you know, stealing all this stuff, then we have grounds to say, I really don't think you got it. Yeah. Yeah, well, I'm not a Christian, but I do get it. I don't go around doing any of those things. I mean, mine, I'm motivated by my simple humanity and my the fact that I care about other people and what happens to them. Um, I'm, I'm not motivated by the possibility that I will have any afterlife of any kind. Okay, next. Can I add something, please? Sure. No, after this guy. Go ahead. What's the basis for plasticizing the faith? Spreading the word of God? What is the basis for what? Plasticizing? Yes, sorry. That's Evangelizing? Yeah, basically. Numbers, numbers. Parts of other things. I think evangelizing is part of any kind of activity. Judaism doesn't evangelize. Judaism doesn't evangelize. Is that true? I don't believe it's true. Okay. I don't believe it's true. And again, yeah. we're talking about, we're talking about oh, groups. Right. We're talking about groups of people as if they're a monolith, right? Yeah. So it's going to be very low hanging fruit to say there are some Jews who do, there are some Buddhists who do. Sherry, but as an organized religion, they don't. Is he right? There are certain aspects, like Chabad does, but most Jews don't. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
No, no, I mean like how did it came into existence? They already they already know that God... Yes, but I mean when did it exactly came into existence? If you say... No, no, I mean uh, in the date, I mean in the th in the time period, like when when these uh, people were writing books in the apocalyptic time. I, okay. Yeah, it's not. Yeah. Jason and I are going to answer that differently. Uh, Jason's got his own yeah. dating method based on uh, Christian Jewish Christian Jewish books. He's read. Uh, <laughs> at least I've read more than one. Just reminding me of my last question. <laughs> David, do you think I've read more than one book? I'll let you Yeah, I'm, I'm not even going to go there. Or you could, huh? Do you honestly believe? Do you honestly believe the only book that John has read? No, no, other Christians, yes. Him, no. Okay, but like, this is the point of getting scholars on stage. Come on. That's the point of getting scholars on stage. Right? To talk about this stuff. I, 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 but I have met Christians who that's like literally the only book they've ever read, and she's nodding along. Right, but I didn't invite them to come and yeah. speak tonight. Yeah, no, I mean Jonathan's obviously a lot more worldly and informed than most most of the lay public, which is why I invite. Exactly. Morris wants to when is the Book of Genesis written? Like, why does it matter? No, I mean sin like sin was day one. Then. Why do they need concept of sin? I mean, they already knew that God would punish them, and it was not called sin. It was not called sin You're at that time. The story is true to begin with. Pardon me? You're assuming the whole story is true. No, I'm not assuming you, that. What I'm assuming that. is that from your conversation that uh, when the heavens... Yes, the for those of you here for the first time tonight, this happens every month. <laughs> every month. Thank you very much, Rajdi, for your question. Love it. Thanks for periscoping. I have a question for you guys before we wrap up. Uh, well, of all, we answer his question? Absolutely not. We're moving on. Okay. Of all of the Christian scholars, Jason, that you have read, which one makes the argument that you find most difficult to refute? Christian theology. Of all the Christian scholars on this topic, who makes the toughest argument for you to refute? Have you ever read a book written by a Christian where you went, Oh, gee, this is making me feel uncomfortable. Because I didn't know this guy's making sense. But it's never happened. Just a few names. Few names of yeah, I, I, I named some Christian scholars, I guess. Any, any that you think would be worth reading. And be prepared. Obviously, you're getting more of the point. Yeah. yeah. Christian scholars are worth reading. Well, yeah, that's the question. Right. I honestly couldn't tell you it's worth reading. Okay. All right. Uh, John, Acad academic scholars, team. people who are biblical scholars. Who no, no, are, I asked the yeah, question. I, you know, so I can name them. Of all, of all of the um, non-Christian scholars, I guess I want to say atheists or non-believers. Who do you think makes the argument that makes you go, "Oh, gee, this is really strong"? Yeah. Right. I'm, I'm going to answer your question. Okay. Um, in, in, the, in the answer of saying Christians are academics, there are actually. Christians in academics. Yes, I understand that. Yep. So um, I, I'll tell you this to, to answer his questions, I answer mine. There are people that I recommend you looking into, like Gleason Archer, uh, Douglas uh, uh, Booth, and, and D.A. Carson, some of these others. And the thing that I'm saying this for is to say if you get their books from evangelical scholarship, you're going to find out that they mention all of these scholars who disagree with them. And that's very important to be balanced, is to find out what your opponents don't believe, such as people like Julius Wellhausen, uh, Robertson Smith. These ones I'm mentioning now are people who are not believers. They're not devout. Right, and I've read their arguments. What part, what part of their arguments? Yeah, and that's going to disappoint, uh, okay. because the arguments that I've read of theirs did not make me say, oh, you know, this is a good point. Um, now, there's some where their presentation is very winsome, Right? Like uh, Christopher Hitchens is a great speaker and a great writer, but in terms of the, the arguments that he's using and putting forward, whether or not I feel like they gain traction, it's not there. Now, I, I can, I'm glad to share things that I think are very challenging to my faith okay, in writing that. as well. But it's not in the terms of archaeology and textual criticism because in a very ironic way, that's very encouraging. If you look into it in an unbiased way, you're going to find out this is very strange. Uh, David and I talked to a, another atheist once, and we finished talking. He said, if what you're saying is correct and true and not just a made-up lie, then the Bible is either the greatest hoax that has ever been or it really is what it says that it is. And I think I'm happy if you go away with that. But the arguments that are challenging for me 
are the ideas of uh, Christian hypocrisy. And, and again, maybe for some of you who are not even in this sphere, you say, what do you mean by that? I mean that I've grown up and I've been around Christians for a long time, and I know all that the, pro the scripture promises they can and should be. And so it's very discouraging to me when I see people who are falling so far short of what I know they're called to be and to do. So that, that might be frustrating, but no, honestly for me, uh, that's exactly how I feel. Um, the arguments in this sphere and in this field are actually very encouraging to me. And it may sound very counterintuitive, but I get encouraged when I read the, uh, the scholars that Jason's mentioning because I'm thinking, if this is all that they're saying, I feel much better than I did at the beginning of the day. All right, guys. I, I still want to hear his answer to Raj, though, so I want to see where we yeah. differ on when that book was written. I get that you want things, but I'm in charge. Okay, <laughs> so thank you very much, everyone, for coming tonight. We really appreciate it. Thank you, Adam, for watching.